In our last video, I covered the top five supplements for extending lifespan, ones that directly work by inhibiting those root causes of aging. But in this video, we're flipping the script. We're talking about three popular supplements also taken for lifespan extension that I just believe do not deliver on that promise. Now, that doesn't mean they're useless. They could still support your health in other ways, but for lifespan extension, the evidence just doesn't stack up. So let's jump in here. We're talking about the mechanisms and the early research that provided promise for each of these, but then we're also talking about the red flags that put all of them on my not for lifespan extension list. First up is resveratrol. And resveratrol is a polyphenol, essentially those plant-based antioxidants and anti-inflammatories that have a ton of studied health benefits. Specifically, resveratrol is a stilbenoid, a type of polyphenol, and it's found in high concentrations in berries and grapes, which is why we talk about it and its importance in our video on red wine. So resveratrol is not made by our bodies, but its intake through dietary means or through supplementation has been highly studied and it's found to be pretty heart and brain protective. It's also found to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and even anti-cancer effects. So again, definitely not a useless supplement, but how does it stack up when it comes to lifespan extension? Well, based on its mechanisms that were found in basic science studies, it appears that resveratrol could decrease nine of those hallmarks of aging that we talked about and described in our last video. Specifically, resveratrol is thought to possibly decrease genomic instability, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, chronic inflammation, dysbiosis, altered intercellular communication, epigenetic alterations, and loss of proteostasis. But most importantly, resveratrol is thought to decrease the hallmark of aging of deregulated nutrient sensing. And deregulated nutrient sensing is essentially when you have mTOR, insulin, IGF-1, those growth and storage pathways being upregulated and running unchecked compared to not having enough of the cleanup and repair pathways, those AMPK pathways, the sirtuins, et cetera. Now that is the hallmark that really got researchers interested in using resveratrol for lifespan extension because resveratrol has been shown in these mechanistic studies to really be good at activating sirtuin-1 and AMPK two of those cleanup and repair pathways that are really important for mitochondrial biogenesis and many other longevity promoting pathways. So basically through all these mechanisms and definitely through that increase in sirtuin activation and AMPK activation, resveratrol is thought to almost act like a caloric restriction mimetic, basically mimicking a lot of the positive effects of caloric restriction, which has been shown time and time again in studies to positively promote lifespan extension. And initial studies on resveratrol's lifespan extending abilities were super promising and actually backed up all these theoretical mechanisms. Specifically in the lowest level of evidence, those lower order organisms, that are less like humans. Think yeast, flies, worms. In that level of evidence, resveratrol has some crazy promising studies across multiple different organisms. Specifically, when yeast were given resveratrol, the average lifespan was increased by 70%. Honeybees also lived an average of 33 to 38% longer when resveratrol was given. And certain species of fish were found to live an average of 33% longer when resveratrol was given and then impressively were even found to increase their maximum lifespan by 30% when resveratrol was given. So obviously this is all super impressive for resveratrol when it comes to this lower level of evidence. But when we start moving up into the higher levels of evidence, that's when the case for resveratrol as a lifespan extending agent really start to fall apart sadly. In the next highest level of evidence, these higher order organisms that are more similar to humans, such as mice, but that are genetically identical, in this level, resveratrol was seen to only increase lifespan in certain circumstances. So for instance, one study looked at three different groups of mice. One group was fed a normal diet, thus they were normal weight. The second group was fed too many calories and thus became overweight. And then the last group was also fed too many calories, were overweight, but were also given resveratrol. In this group, the resveratrol was seen to improve their lifespan by 20 to 30% compared to the group of mice that were also overweight and also being fed too many calories, but did not get resveratrol. Essentially what the resveratrol did in this group was made their lifespan similar to the group that already was eating a normal diet and was already normal weight, which is super impressive. But in a different study, when resveratrol was just given to the group of mice that were normal weight and eating a normal diet, 
it did not extend their lifespan at all. And the reason for this situational lifespan extension is probably the fact that resveratrol's caloric restriction mimicking effect is obviously much more profound in individuals who are eating too many calories compared to those who are eating a normal amount of calories. And again, this level of evidence is more important than the lower level that we talked about with the lower order organisms. Because when you're asking yourself the question, do these preclinical or non-human studies translate to me, translate to humans actually extending their lifespan, you're asking yourself, how similar are we humans to the organisms that were tested in the studies? We are much more similar to mice compared to yeast, honeybees, flies, etc. So it's more important to see data of lifespan extension in the mice or in the higher order organisms. Not seeing it in the higher order organisms or the mice really trumps the positive evidence that we saw earlier. And in this level of evidence that we have, it seems to say that if you are eating a normal calorie diet, then you're probably not going to get any benefit on lifespan extension from resveratrol. But what about the highest level of non-human evidence? These higher order organisms, such as mice, again, but this time that are genetically heterogeneous. Essentially, mice that do not all share the exact same genetic code. This is the highest level of evidence because these model organisms are the most similar to humans. Thus, we can best translate it to answer the question, does this compound, resveratrol in this case, actually increase lifespan in humans? Well, unfortunately, at this level of evidence, resveratrol was again not shown to increase the lifespan of these organisms. And this was the real nail in the coffin to me when it comes to making the conclusion of resveratrol not being a lifespan extender in humans. And reason being is that these studies were done by the Interventions Testing Program, or the ITP, which performs these studies in a very scientifically rigorous and consistent method. And then that on top of the fact that again, they tested it in genetically heterogeneous mice, which out of all the studies we just talked about are the most similar to humans. And resveratrol failed two different times in two different studies from the ITP. In the first study, the ITP gave these genetically heterogeneous mice resveratrol starting at middle age and then throughout the rest of their life. They tried two different concentrations and at both concentrations, resveratrol did not extend lifespan. And then in a second study, they tried again and they gave resveratrol even earlier in life, starting at an equivalent of 20 years old in humans, which was starting to give resveratrol to the mice at four months old. And resveratrol was again, not shown to extend lifespan. So all in all, resveratrol has been shown pretty consistently to have no impact on lifespan extension in the higher order organisms that it's been tested in. And these are the organisms most similar to humans. So to me, it is very unlikely that resveratrol will extend lifespan if you are already eating a normal calorie diet and our normal weight. The only possible use case for this one when it comes to lifespan extension is if you are someone who is obese or eating too many calories in your diet. In that case, resveratrol may have some lifespan extending abilities. However, if this is the case for you, there are many other interventions to do that can improve your lifespan that I would do first before resveratrol anyways. So for me, I'm not really recommending anyone take resveratrol for lifespan extending purposes. Next up is fisetin. And fisetin is another polyphenol like resveratrol, but this one is a flavonoid instead of the stilbonoid that resveratrol is. Fisetin is found in highest concentrations in apples and strawberries, and to a lesser extent in other fruits and veggies. And given that it's a flavonoid, it has many anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, and it's also being studied for its positive neurologic effects, as well as possible anti-cancer effects. And specifically in regards to inhibiting the aging process, fisetin is thought to decrease seven of those hallmarks of aging. Specifically, it's thought that fisetin may be able to decrease loss of proteostasis, mitochondrial dysfunction, genomic instability, deregulated nutrient sensing, dysbiosis, chronic inflammation. And then most importantly, and definitely most uniquely, fisetin is thought to decrease the hallmark of aging of cellular senescence. Through multiple molecular pathways, fisetin essentially is thought to promote the clean killing of senescent cells, or essentially cells that can no longer grow and divide properly, and thus they release a bunch of inflammatory particles and damage surrounding tissue. So it's thought that by fisetin's ability to promote the clean killing of these cells, you're going to inhibit 
a lot of the inflammation and tissue damage that they would otherwise cause, and thus you are able to delay aging. And through this mechanism and through acting on those other hallmarks of aging, fisetin showed a lot of early promise for being a potential lifespan extender. And this promise was initially backed up in early studies. So similar to resveratrol in that lowest level of evidence in those lower order organisms, fisetin had a lot of success. Specifically in yeast, when fisetin was given, it increased their average lifespan by 55%. And also when fisetin was given to fruit flies, it increased their average lifespan by 23%. And the data still remained promising even in genetically homogenous mice, that next level of evidence. And the same can't be said for resveratrol like we just talked about. In this group, fisetin was started at 20 months of age, which is an equivalent age for humans of 60 to 70 years old. From this point, they continued to give fisetin for the rest of the organism's life, and it was found to increase average lifespan by 10% in these genetically homogenous mice. So it was all good news for fisetin until that highest level of non-human evidence. And that's where the case really started to fall apart for fisetin. In the genetically heterogeneous mice, Again, in these studies done by the interventions testing program, fisetin unfortunately did not extend the lifespan of either the male or the female genetically heterogeneous mice. And while this doesn't mean with 100% certainty that fisetin is not a lifespan extender in humans, I would say it makes it much less likely because again, these ITP studies on the genetically heterogeneous mice are the most similar thing we have to a human model for lifespan extension studies. So while I do like fisetin better than resveratrol because it has more positive evidence in at least the genetically homogenous mice, I'm still sticking away from fisetin as a lifespan extender until I see more positive evidence in models that are even more similar to humans. And last up are NAD plus precursors or NMN or NR. And essentially the thought is here, you're taking NMN or nicotinamide mononucleotide or NR, nicotinamide riboside, to essentially boost your NAD plus levels since they are both eventually converted to NAD plus. And essentially this is thought to potentially be beneficial because NAD plus is required by the mitochondria in every cell to produce energy in the most efficient way and is also important for many other processes related to aging. Specifically, it's thought that low NAD plus levels would contribute to eight hallmarks of aging. Specifically, these low NAD plus levels could contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of proteostasis, genomic instability, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, dysbiosis, chronic inflammation, and then finally, the hallmark of aging that is most related to low NAD plus levels is deregulated nutrient sensing, the same one that resveratrol was especially important for. And NAD plus is super important here because it's very important for activating those sirtuins, the same enzymes we talked about with resveratrol that are extremely important for cellular metabolism, cellular maintenance and repair, all of which are highly important for slowing aging. And specifically, NAD plus is really important here because sirtuins are NAD dependent enzymes, meaning that they require NAD to actually function. So because NAD plus is so important for sirtuin activation, as well as important for inhibiting all these other hallmarks of aging, you can probably see why the scientific community has been so excited about trying to find ways to increase its levels to promote lifespan extension. And then what made the scientific community even more excited about this prospect was the fact that they have multiple studies demonstrating that NAD plus could decrease with age. And if NAD plus truly does decrease with age, that would make it even more promising as a lifespan extender, because essentially what you would be doing is replacing a deficiency that is driving aging. However, we should have some caution here because all of the studies that show that NAD plus decreases with age are all cross-sectional studies. Essentially, we have studies that look in one point of time, they look at younger individuals, say 30 year olds, and older individuals at the same point in time, 50 year olds say. And what they found was that NAD plus levels are lower in the group of older individuals. However, what we don't have as of yet are any longitudinal studies looking at NAD plus levels over time. A longitudinal study is a higher level of evidence when it comes to aging research. And what that essentially means is you would look at NAD plus levels in 30 year olds say, and then you would look at those levels in the same individuals 20 years later and see, did their levels actually decrease with aging? And there have been cases when compounds have been shown to decrease with age 
in cross-sectional studies like we have for NAD+, but when you get the longitudinal study, they were not shown to decrease with age, i.e. taurine, like we talked about in the last video. So I definitely think we need some longitudinal studies to prove the fact that NAD plus decreased with age. But I think it is more likely than not that NAD plus does decrease with age, which again adds more excitement to its potential as a lifespan extender. So because of this and all that other mechanistic promise for raising NAD plus levels being related to lifespan extension, there's been a decent amount of research for how do we actually raise NAD plus levels through supplementation. And this is where NMN and NR come in. Due to how essential NAD plus is, it's obviously made by the body as are NMN and NR. But NAD plus is not a great supplement because it's not well absorbed and it's rapidly degraded before actually being able to get into the cell where it can have all of its positive benefits. The precursors of NAD plus, NMN and NR on the other hand, are much more readily absorbed than NAD plus and are not as quickly degraded. Thus the ability for both NMN and NR to increase NAD plus levels in humans has been well studied and documented. And this is why researchers have landed on using NMN and NR to boost NAD plus levels and then hopefully promote lifespan extension. But did they ever determine is NMN or NR better? Well, there have been no head-to-head -head studies comparing the two, but mechanistically to me, it would make more sense to supplement with NR compared to NMN. Reason being is that when you supplement with NMN, it has to be converted to NR before it can be transported into the cell where it is then converted back into NMN and then converted to NAD plus again. So to me, supplementing with NR is more direct and a more efficient process compared to supplementing with NMN. And that's why most of the beneficial lifespan extension studies we're about to talk about do use NR. However, again, there has been no direct NMN versus NR comparison studies, so this hasn't really been proven yet. But regardless, the ability of both NMN and NR to increase NAD plus levels made the scientific community super excited about those specific supplements' ability to potentially prolong lifespan. So let's get into the data. Did it actually promote lifespan in model organisms? Well, in our lowest level of evidence, again, those lower order organisms, we actually have way less studies here compared to what you might think and even compared to the other two supplements in this video. Really the only study we have on wild type or normal versions of these lower order organisms is in yeast. And this study demonstrated that when NR was given, it increased the average lifespan of the yeast by 15 to 30% depending on the circumstance which is still positive data. We just don't have as much data here as even resveratrol or fisetin. Then at the next level of evidence, again, those genetically homogenous mice, we also don't have a ton of data here, but there was one study that gave NR to genetically homogenous mice starting only late in life and a human equivalent of 65 to 70 years old. And it was found to increase lifespan by a very mild 5%. So definitely a small increase here, but it was late in life, so I'd still classify this as a positive result. But the same can't be said for when we get to the highest level of non-human evidence, again, those genetically heterogeneous mice from the ITP studies. Similar to fisetin and resveratrol, when NR was tested in these genetically heterogeneous mice, it did not extend the lifespan in either male or female mice. Which again, it's only one study, but it's the study we have that's most similar to humans. So for me, it is the nail in the coffin in regards to placing NR and NMN on my do not take for lifespan extension list. But specifically in the case of NMN and NR, I'm really just not even impressed by the whole body of research when it comes to lifespan extension. Like we mentioned, it has way less studies on lower order organisms than even the two also negative supplements on this list. Secondly, its evidence in the genetically homogenous mice shows only a very mild increase in lifespan extension, even mild compared to the other negative supplement on this list, fisetin. So not only is NMN and NR probably even less impressive than fisetin and resveratrol, two other supplements I'm also saying not to take, it really, really pales in comparison compared to the top five supplements for lifespan extension in our previous video. So while the mechanism did seem very promising, the actual lifespan extension data in model organisms is much less promising to me. So I'd stay away from this one for lifespan extension purposes. But for my top five lifespan extending supplements, I do recommend you consider taking. Check out our last video here if you haven't watched that one yet. And if you already watched that, check out other supplement reviews here.